My name's Adrian Glover. I'm a research scientist here at the Natural History Museum. I work in the Darwin Centre, which is just next door to this amazing new gallery. And I study the deep sea, in fact, the deep sea biology, the animals that live in the very deepest parts of our ocean. In fact, the commonest environment on our planet. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the amazing animals that we brought up from 5,000 metres in the, a place called the clarion Clipperton Zone in the Central Pacific, Abyssal Plain, but also about deep sea minerals and the potential for those as a resource. You mentioned the clarion Clipperton Zone there. Could you just tell us briefly what that is? It's a vast area, six million square kilometres. So almost as big as the continental landmass of the USA. It lies between Mexico and Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific. The seafloor there is cold, it's dark. Uh, very, very limited amounts of food. It has these amazing, weird polymetallic nodules, these mineral nodules sitting on the seabed. Also, there is life, there is biology there as well. And now we're going there, we're recovering organisms there, getting data, getting knowledge on the biodiversity of this environment so we can try to address some of these concerns for where the evidence you know, needed to inform these decisions on how the, the region might be managed. And could you tell me a little bit about some of these strange creatures that you might find there and any geological oddities that have been found? So I mean, one of the most amazing things and experiences that I've had is being able to use a remotely operated vehicle to see live animals at the seabed, at the seafloor, moving, swimming, interacting with their environment. And we typically do this on a very big 100 meter research ship. We've lowered a, a car sized mini robot submersible to the seabed and we have incredible imagery beam back to the surface. We work 24 hours, we're up all, all crazy hours of the, of the day and the night, uh, the, the ship never stops working. Wandering into the remotely operated vehicle control room and then seeing these wonders on the screen of things that no one else has seen is truly inspirational and very privileged, really. So we've got on display, we've got what, what might be called abyssal megafauna. They are things like sea cucumbers. When they're alive, they swim across the seabed like that, some of them crawling picking up food that's fallen from the sunlit surface waters above. Of course, there's no light in the deep sea. All of the energy that these organisms need comes from the surface. We've got some things which might be a bit familiar. Little sea stars, there's a starfish there. In the middle there, there's a, a, it's a coral, actually. Abyssopathes is the genus. So it's actually growing in one of these nodules, which is of interest uh, for, as a mineral resource. And I know this area has been targeted for deep sea mining. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell me why that is. So the clarion Clipperton zone in the 1960s, scientists went out there and took images of the seafloor and said, oh my goodness, there's all of these trillions of little nodules sitting on the seabed. And they quite quickly realized that this is potentially a commercial resource. They're rich in cobalt, nickel, manganese, some other minerals as well. And nowadays, uh, the, the manganese is less interest, but the cobalt and the nickel are of interest, particularly for battery metals. Good evidence is needed on the biodiversity and on the environmental impacts that would happen so that society, if you like, can make an informed decision going forward. Uh, and that's where we sit uh, as scientists in, in the debate. There are many voices opposed and many voices in favour, but we sit in the middle and effectively trying to provide you know, evidence and information. So what does the research that we have so far suggest about the threats that the mining could pose to all these amazing creatures that are down there. So there are other types of deep sea mining, so mining of hydrothermal vents and mining of sea mounts, but also deep sea. But excluding those for the moment, think about mining these nodules in this region. The main threats are, of course, if you drive a mining machine across the seabed, you're going to remove the nodules, that's the resource, so that goes, and then you leave the compacted sediment behind which will be reduced in, in biodiversity and faunal abundance. A broader and perhaps more critical question, which we don't have the answer to yet, is what's the risk of biodiversity loss, you know, actual extinctions. So you can distinguish the ecological impacts of a mining disturbance versus the, the risk of actual species loss, which is an irrevocable loss, really. For that, we, we need to have better information on the taxonomy, describe the species, have the knowledge of their species ranges and where else they might exist. And in the current scenario is that there would be perhaps mining allowed, but with set aside areas that are protected. So we need to know, are those set aside areas representative of the biodiversity in the mined areas? And then we could say loss of biodiversity should be minimized. My final question about your research um, is about why it is so important that um, we protect the deep sea and all the amazing things we can learn if we do protect it and continue to study it. So something that's throughout this gallery is actually understanding the importance of biodiversity intrinsically. And, and humanity has recognised that. So, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity does state that we want to try to protect biodiversity, even if we don't know how useful it might be. So we don't know, for example, whether these animals are going to provide useful compounds, some chemicals that might have anti-cancer properties. We haven't studied whether the microbes in the sediments of the deep sea might have bacteria which have antimicrobial properties that could be useful for antibiotics. Prevalent upon us to 
to protect biodiversity where we can. We have to balance that against the needs of feeding ourselves and providing medicines and all the things that we need as humans. We can't say, oh, these animals will provide food on your plate or the cure for cancer, but these things they might do in the future. And uh, so this is why we need to protect biodiversity now.